And welcome to the second in our series of faculty forums on topics of the day. Uh, today, we are going to focus on the future of the U.S. economy. Is it going to improve? Um, and a uh, very important topic for, for our time. Uh, what we're doing is showcasing uh, faculty at Iowa State and alumni uh, who are experts in the field. The forums are open to the Iowa State community as well as the broader Ames community and really in designed to introduce you to our faculty and to inform you on the issues of the day. Uh, the third forum is on November 3rd. It will be on climate change. I want to thank the academic departments that have participated in these forums, uh, the ISU Committee on Lectures for co-sponsoring the forums uh, with the Provost's Office and the Committee on Lectures for organizing the forums as well. Uh, today, uh, the Forum on Economic Recovery will be moderated by the Chair of the Economics Department, uh, Giancarlo Moschini, and a holder of the Pioneer Chair in Science and Technology Policy. So Giancarlo will make a few opening comments and introduce the speakers. Thank you, Giancarlo. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Provost Hoffman. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with some colleagues and friends. Uh, and. Um, uh, Betsy um, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, some of the work I, I do is um, um, think about economics of innovations, uh, um, and that usually is associated with uh, uh, long run growth. Uh, but what we are um, here to talk about today is a major speed bump uh, on, on the road to um, economic growth. And, and uh, before I introduce the speaker, let me introduce uh, the topic a little bit. And it's been a, a, year, a year that uh, an economist uh, views as interesting, uh, um, painful as well, of course. Uh, and about a year ago, we were on the verge of a major uh, uh, financial uh, crisis, uh, the roots of which have been much debated, and that would be the object of some of um, uh, tonight's uh, panel. But before we knew it, uh, we were in the middle of a major uh, economic downturn, a major recession. Uh, which uh, we now know uh, was already underway, actually, and it's been now dated as having started in December uh, 2007. Uh, it's been said that this is the worst recession since uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s, um, perhaps. Again, that's another um, issue that the panelists tonight um, will uh, hopefully sh uh, shed some light um, up. Uh, certainly, um, it's not the only one we've had you know, 10 or 11 since the end of the Second World War, uh, although this seems to be the longest and uh, yet uh, the deepest. Um, the um, severity of the um, economic crisis uh, should be apparent to everyone. Uh, by the beginning of this year, the, um, economies, uh, the economy was shedding uh, jobs at a rate of about 700,000 uh, jobs per month. You know, that's... Uh, uh, that's quite steep, uh, and the GDP fell you know, nearly 7 percent point at an annualized rate in the first quarter alone of this, um, uh, of this year. Unemployment soared. Uh, now it's at the highest it's been for a long time, 9.8 percent, um, and uh, trade volume uh, fell sharply as well, you know, so 15 percent uh, uh, um, decrease, dram dramatic decrease in trade. That shows again how uh, intertwined the world economists are as a result of indeed uh, global, uh, globalizations of, um, of uh, the economy. Uh, all that has um, led to a number of actions, um, uh, dramatic action by the Treasury and by the uh, Federal Reserve Board last year to stop what looked like a financial meltdown, and then a very aggressive stimulus, um, uh, stimulus effort by uh, the federal uh, government, as many as seven and $787 billion have been um, um, set aside. Uh, the current indicator suggests that um, the recovery is underway. Um, how slow, uh, how fast that may be, again, is an open question, and we hope to learn something uh, about it uh, 
about it tonight. Uh, the experience, of course, suggests that um, uh, recessions that follow a major financial um, uh, crisis are typically slow uh, and um, recovery is, um, is uh, painful. To uh, discuss all of that, we have um, um, a great set of panelists tonight, a diversified portfolio, I must say. Uh, and I will introduce briefly the three of them and then um, hand over the mic. Uh, starting with the far left uh, is David Frankel. He's an associate professor in economics uh, um, in my department. He's uh, an economic theorist and is interested in addition to theory in financial economics and that's where this, uh, his expertise will be more valuable uh, tonight. Uh, David holds a PhD in uh, economics from the, um, from the MIT. Uh, before that, he had a, a master's science in sociology uh, from Oxford, and before that, he had uh, undergraduate degree in mathematics. So you see that he's uh, been converging for some time. He's been at Iowa State since uh, 2003. Um, in the middle is uh, Peter Orazen. Uh, Peter has been with Iowa State about um, 55 years. Uh, <laughs> I know he doesn't, he doesn't look that old, but he was actually born uh, at Iowa State University. Uh, he didn't stay very long after that, uh, when his dad was a graduate student in our department, actually. Uh, he uh, grew up in Kansas, uh, got his PhD uh, in economics from Yale, and has been at Iowa State in the faculty since 1982. He's uh, specialized in uh, labor economics and um, a number of, um, uh, of related uh, topics. Um, finally, uh, closest to me is uh, David Peters. Uh, David is an assistant professor uh, in sociology. Uh, he holds his PhD from the University of Missouri, uh, Columbia. And before coming to Iowa State, uh, where he has been since uh, 2006, uh, he was briefly at the um, University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Uh, um, his focus is gonna be somewhat different. Uh, uh, and uh, is um, going to highlight his own work that is on uh, poverty and uh, rural uh, development. And so um, the format that we're gonna follow is each of the panelists will uh, make a brief introduction about uh, their views in, um, uh, on, on the topic that we are here to discuss tonight. Uh, and that will open it up for, uh, for discussion and question and answers. So um, uh, David. Uh, okay. Thanks very much. Um, Last year when the stock market started to become very volatile, I gave an interview or two on local radio stations and people often ask me what's going to happen with the market. And um, of course, uh, I didn't know. Um, but uh, I told them really that you should be talking to my father, who uh, is 70 years old and in December 2007 started to get spooked by what was happening in the market and sold all of his stocks to mutual funds. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't so lucky as most other people weren't. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the, the roots of the problems um, that began back in 2007. Uh, as most people know, they began with the mortgage-backed securities, which consisted of um, uh, regular mortgages, which were uh, uh, solid, as well as a lot of uh, not-so-solid lo uh, loans, which are called subprime loans, uh, which were encouraged by federal government policy under both Republicans and Democrats, aimed uh, uh, at expanding home ownership to low-income families, which was a desirable goal. Um, at the same time, uh, there was a, uh, um, a parallel development of repackaging these mortgages into securities uh, and selling them. And um, uh, this actually began in 1970, but really became very popular in the, in the, in the last decade. And the problem here is what's called moral hazard. And uh, many of you might have heard uh, that phrase before. What it means basically is that um, if somebody's taking an action that you don't observe and that action can affect your welfare, then, uh, then they, they have a tendency to take actions that uh, affect you adversely too often. So in this case, for example, um, mortgage brokers and banks that originated mortgages got fees from originating those mortgages, and so they had an incentive to, uh, to issue lots of mortgages, and, not, and they didn't have the proper incentive to check that the, the borrower's credit was good enough because they weren't planning on holding the loans to maturity. So uh, starting in, the, uh, in 2007, the U.S. real estate market started to weaken, and um, it, it soon became clear that the, these mortgage-backed securities were vastly overvalued, 
And this caused problems for institutions that invested in them, which included a lot of, uh, a lot of banks and a lot of investment banks, um, and uh, caused a lot of volatility in financial markets. Uh, the um, uh, ability of banks to borrow from each other, it, it, um, it deteriorated. And uh, there was a sequence of, um, of runs on banks, which were not as visible as they were in the 30s, because today you just have to click your, your mouse button to withdraw your funds. You don't have to stand in line outside the bank. So, but even though they were invisible, they were still happening. And um, uh, so this brings up the question of why do these runs occur? And uh, that relates to uh, um, a course I teach uh, on macroeconomics. We talk, we talk about this, that one important role of banks is to, uh, bri to, to form a bridge between people who are basically short-term depositors. They put their money in. They want to have access to it at all times. But, and the borrowers who have long-term projects, for example, you want to buy a house and you're planning on paying it back over a long period of time. Um, and uh, essentially, the, because um, the chance of somebody will need to withdraw their money um, is, um, uh, is um, the percentage of people who need to withdraw their money is fairly predictable for banks. If people don't all withdraw their money, they just withdraw it when they need it, then the bank can predict how much they'll have and how much they can lend for these long-term projects, and everything goes pretty smoothly. The problem, though, is that if everybody expects everybody else to withdraw their money, then everybody wants to withdraw their money, and, that's, um, and, that's, and that can be very bad. Uh, <clears throat> In particular, once rumors start as to the health of a bank being bad, everybody wants to withdraw their money. And um, even though we have deposit insurance, people don't care that much because they don't want the inconvenience of having to wait for their money. They'd rather just um, uh, you know, click on a mouse button and transfer to a different fund or a different bank. So uh, <clears throat> now, um, there were some banks that did not have deposit insurance. Those are the investment banks, such as Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. And, uh, these banks also were heavily invested in these mortgage-backed securities, and, they, and their financial difficulties posed a dilemma for the government because, um, on the one hand, they weren't covered by insurance, so why not just let them fail? But on the other hand, the, uh, the fact that they're interrelated, inter interdependent, means that if they let a big bank fail, like a big investment bank fail, then it, it, it posed a risk for the, the health of the financial system. People might be afraid to, uh, to deal with, with each other because they're afraid that the person they're dealing with might go bankrupt and they wouldn't get their money back. So, um, so the decision was taken to, buy, to bail out uh, most, actually all but one of the uh, investment banks, Lehman Brothers, was allowed to fail. At the time, I thought that was very risky. I still think it was very risky. Um, and, uh, and I think probably that they should have saved Lehman as well. But on the other hand, you know that it would have cost $600 billion, and that's a lot of money. Um, regarding the stimulus package, I just want to say that uh, there is, economists believe that there is a role for the government to stimulate to stimulate the economy in a recession, because a stimulus can um, make people more optimistic about the future, more willing to invest. Um, and as, but however, as to the exact size, how big the stimulus should be, economists really don't know. Um, and um, regarding these mortgage-backed securities, my final comment is just that uh, uh, we do need to think about regula regulating them in the long run, but that's not a very pressing uh, concern right now, because essentially there are no more or mortgage-backed securities being issued. So, um, you know, in a few years, people will forget about this, the problems we've had and start issuing them again, because it's very tempting. But, in the, but we, we probably have a few years before we need to worry about that. OK, well, I'm going to take off from that and, and talk a little bit about how the recession has affected labor markets at the, in the United States and also in Iowa. And I'm going to compare uh, this particular recession to past recessions to get some sense as to whether uh, where the problem is, 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 is more uh, difficult than in, in past recessions and where it's more similar to past recessions. And I'm going to return to one of the themes that David talked about, which is the root cause of this recession in terms of weakness in the housing market and how that explains where you see the recession most severe in the United States and what the implications are for Iowa going forward. So it, is Iowa going to come out of this in, in relatively good shape or relatively poor shape uh, relative to other uh, states in the United States? And finally, uh, I'm going to return to the stimulus and talk a little bit about how weakness in, in the housing market and then in the stock market sort of led to some problems in terms of the, the macro economy and ultimately why uh, uh, the government started using stimulus and why it might or might not work. 
So just to uh, put things in perspective, Giancarlo said that uh, uh, this is a particularly uh, damaging recession in terms of job loss. We've lost 7 million jobs since December of 2007. That's roughly 5% of uh, the jobs in the United States that occurred in, uh, that were in existence in that time. But the, the, this is not sort of uniform across all sectors of the economy. So the weakest ones are the ones that are most sensitive to uh, weakness in the economy. Big ticket items like houses, so construction, uh, we've lost about 14 percent of the jobs nationally. Manufacturing overall about 12 percent. Uh, durable goods is particularly hit hard because those are big, big ticket items and, and we've lost 15 percent of the jobs. But in general in the United States we've lost jobs in every sector of the economy save one. Guess what that is? Government. Right. So the government, we actually added jobs. Every place else, we, uh, we lost jobs. Uh, if you look at Iowa, we've been, uh, I mean, it's still a, a, the, the most severe recession since 1982, but nevertheless, it's relatively mild. We've lost 3% of our jobs. Our recession's about 12 months old, uh, relative to 23 months now and counting for the U.S. as a whole. There are two sectors of the Iowa economy that are in worse shape than the national economy. Durable goods manufacturing, we've given away one-fifth of our jobs in durable goods manufacturing, so that's like John Deere or Winnebago. And the other sector is professional business services, so we've given up 9% of those jobs relative to 7% nationally, and a lot of those are temporary service or office work type jobs. Both of those two sectors have been hit hard in Iowa, not because we were hit early on in the recession, but because they rely on national or international markets for their products, and weakness nationally and internationally in demand for, for business services, particularly business to business services, and durable goods manufacturing is costing us those jobs here in Iowa. We actually have done relatively well. Iowa uniquely added jobs in finance uh, since the start of the recession. Uh, we've added jobs in retail which is also relatively uh, unique, uh, and we've also added jobs in, in government as well as education since the start of this recession. So we're actually doing relatively well with this exception of those two sectors plus uh, some weakness in the construction industry. Uh, our current unemployment rate is 6.8 percent. That's about 2 percent above our long-run average. Nationally, the unemployment rate is 9.8 percent, which is roughly four percentage points above the long-run U.S. average. So uh, once again, we're in relatively good position. So how does this recession compare to past recessions? In Iowa, the 92 and 2001 recessions were very mild. In fact, you can't really tell that there was a 92 recession uh, in Iowa. If you look at our current uh, recession, um, unemployment rate of 6.8 percent. Uh, if you listen to uh, some of the politicians, they'll say this is the worst recession in, you know, since the Depression or something like that. Well, the 1982 recession hit Iowa extremely hard. Uh, we were in recession for roughly 62 months where we had unemployment rates of 6.8 percent or more, which is the current unemployment rate which we've had for one month. So we're a fair bit of difference away from the 1982 recession. And if you look at the root cause of the 1982 recession in Iowa, we had a bubble in the farmland market, believe it or not. And so the reason we had a really bad recession at that time was the farmland bubble broke, and that caused weakness in our financial sector, and that dragged out the recession in Iowa. And that's sort of why we're in relatively good position now, because we never had a housing price bubble. And I'll argue in just a bit that places that had the bubble burst in the housing market are the places with the most severe problems and they're going to be the least well positioned to come out of this recession. So if you look at where we are, uh, this is worse than the 92 and 2001 recessions. It's not as bad as the uh, 82 recession and the 82 recession was much worse. Now why do politicians talk about the depression? It's because you don't get any glory in saving us from a mild recession. And not only that, but Rahm Emanuel was quoted, perhaps uh, uh, he w didn't want to be quoted, but he was quoted, he didn't want to waste this recession. So why would he say that? It, it's because if you, there's this sense of urgency, then you can get all kinds of foolish, well, uh, you can get all kinds of things passed. 
that might not bear the, the light of day, you know, in the cold, uh, you know, clear dawn of the morning or something along those lines. So there's no sense in a politician underplaying how bad things are because eventually they're going to get worse and by golly, you're going to want to take credit for, for how bad it is. And if you don't make it better, at least you can say it was the worst problem. No other, you know, uh, uh, person ever had to deal with this sort of stuff. So. So far, we've lost 5% of our jobs. We're 23 months into this recession. The unemployment rate has been above 6.1%, which is the US average for about 14 months. Is that the Great Depression? And the answer is nowhere near. The unemployment rate in the Great Depression peaked at 25%. We lost 25% of our jobs during the Great Depression, and it took us eight years to get back to our prior level of employment. We had unemployment rates of over 8% for 11 years straight. So we have eight months so far of unemployment rates over, I mean, that doesn't mean we won't get there eventually, but let's hope not, right? So this is not the Great Depression. It, it is a relatively severe recession, but part of the reason it seems so bad is we had a relatively good run of it since the 82 recession. The 92 through 2001 period was the longest, strongest labor market in the history of the United States. And coming off of that, uh, I mean, uh, the early parts of this recession, we didn't really give away that many jobs. We didn't even reach 6% unemployment for the first half of the current recession. And historically, that would have been a pretty good labor market. That's still below average for our unemployment rates. So where does this recession compare? We've lost about 2.5% of our gross domestic product from the peak. That's about average for recessions in the post-war period. We've lost about 1% of our consumption, which is about average for the post-war period. We've lost about 3% of our per capita incomes, which is about average for, uh, for recessions in the post-war period. What's unique about this recession is its length. The average unemployment uh, length of recession has been six to nine months in the post-war period, so this one's very long. And secondly, the, the giveaway of jobs. So 5% is, is relatively severe. The average is usually about half that. And so that's what is unique about this recession is its length and how much it's hit, hit the, the, the job market. So where is it worst? Uh, Michigan has the highest unemployment rate at 15.2%, uh, and Ohio and Illinois are both above 10%, and they have unemployment rates that are that high for the traditional reasons, and that is that they have weakness in durable goods manufacturing that is sort of spread through their economies, and that's why they're in trouble. The rest of them are, the rest of the places where you have high unemployment rates in the U.S. are the fastest growing places in the United States, okay? Uh, Florida. Uh, California, Nevada, Georgia are the four fastest growing states in the United States over the last 35 years, and they now have uh, unemployment rates above 10 percent, and that's entirely due to what David talked about with their, their housing markets. In Phoenix, their housing market since July 2006, housing prices have fallen 53 percent. So that means you had a $200,000 house in July 2006, you had a $400,000 house by July 2007, and you have a $200,000 house today. Now, why is that a problem? People borrowed money against the appreciation of their housing values. And so they borrowed $200,000 thinking they were worth $400,000 in terms of their housing, and they're back down to a $200,000 house. And so there are a lot of people who thought they were a lot wealthier than it turned out they were, and they made a lot of, of decisions based on that. And then when you get these sharp fluctuations in housing prices, it creates difficulties all across the economy in terms of their finances. So the problems that Iowa had in 1982 because of our land price bubble, that's what all these other places have now because of their housing price bubble. Why is Iowa in a relatively good position? We sidestep that. So, we actually have not given away jobs in finance, for example. If the, if the, if the U.S. economy is, is coming out of recession, the firms that are based in Des Moines are in much better position than the ones that have given away uh, sometimes close to half of their staff in the last couple of years. And so uh, if you look at the insurance firms in Des Moines, the finance firms in Des Moines, they're going to be much better coming out of this recession than other places, assuming that the rest of the world 
and the rest of the nation starts buying our stuff, right? Because we want them to do that in manufacturing. I think I'm over seven minutes, so I think I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit with my presentation. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is not necessarily sort of macro level um, explanations of the current recession, but more on what's the implication on people, particularly in terms of economic well-being of individuals and the economic well-being of communities. So I'm interested in how changes in the economy, changes in economic structure plays out in terms of poverty and near poverty in, in local communities. So in a sense, if you want to look at it, the, the effect or what sort of the pain or the misery index, I know that's a particular index, but it, sort of an index of misery of, of communities and, and individuals as the economy restructures, as we kind of work through the recession and the recovery. So one thing you may ask, why, what does poverty have to do with recessions and, and economic uh, recovery? But before I get into that, I want you to consider a few, uh, consider the following. Since the 1970s, on average, the economy has grown about 3 to 3.5% 3 per annum in real terms uh, over the last 40 years. So fairly robust growth that Peter had mentioned. Um, in terms of the labor market, the, the best labor market in the last, um, since 1982. However, at the same time we've had this fairly robust growth, poverty rates have remained relatively fixed. They've fluctuated between 11 and 12 percent over the last 40 years. So even though we've had growth in the economy, poverty has remained relatively fixed. Our best current estimate of poverty is that we have about 13 percent of the U.S. population in poverty, or about 35 million people. Now, what does this suggest? First, it, it suggests two things. One, that there's a mismatch, perhaps, between economic growth and social welfare. And secondly, that there may be a mismatch, that this economic growth hasn't been evenly distributed or diffused throughout the U.S. population. And why this matters? Well, it matters if you have persistently poor areas, persistently poor individuals, over the long term will limit economic growth and over the long term will put strains on public bu budget. So it's important that we tend to redistribute some of this wealth across the country to sort of ameliorate these negative aspects of, of, of economic growth. Okay, now what I want to talk about is a little bit of my current research on linking poverty with economic restructuring. Now, uh, the previous panelists have talked about very macro level, um, sort of macroeconomic explanations. I'm going to look at what we call the meso level. I'm interested in how it impacts communities, particularly counties. I'm also interested in labor markets, but I take a, a, a more strict definition in terms of changes in occupational structure. So not necessarily changes in industries, but changes in the, the jobs that people have. How is being employed as a um, computer programmer affects your chances of being poor compared to uh, a plumber or a welder, for example. So the current recession, much like the 2002 and previous recessions, is going to continue to restructure our economy away from what we call traditional working class occupations, production occupation, production occupations, ag, forestry, fishing occupations, and occupations in the trades towards a more services-based economy or services occupations. And these services are bifurcated into generally high-skill, high-wage occupations and relatively low-skill, low-wage occupations. And so my two main research questions are, first, what has occupational restructuring meant for the well-being of places? And what can states do to try to ameliorate or, or lessen the negative impacts of this economic restructuring? And to answer this question, I looked at uh, data for all 3,100 counties in the U.S. Uh, back to 1970 and tried to model how changes in occupational structure impacted rates of poverty and rates of near poverty. That would be poverty rates of 150 to 200 percent of poverty. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what some of my findings were. So first, the first finding on, on what impact occupational structure has on local poverty is that uh, between 1970 and, and 2000, uh, this is, remember, we're looking at occupational data, so we don't, it's by place of residence, not by place of, of work, that professional managerial jobs is associated, was strongly associated with a reduction in both poverty and near poverty. And this makes sense, that they're, since they're relatively high skill, high wage, uh, high educated jobs. So what's the implication in the current recession? 
Well, nationally anyway, the current recession um, has, has hit hardest this group of professionals, managerials, people employed in professional services, the business sector, the finance sector, uh, experienced very large losses uh, nationally. And from all uh, from the best that I've been able to, f to glean is that the recovery will likely be slow in regaining these jobs. So this means losses, if a community is experiencing large, large losses in professional managerial jobs, this will likely increase poverty rates and near poverty rates at the, low, at the local level. And since we're going to typically, we're likely experience a very slow recovery, recovery of these jobs, it's really going to hinder economic well-being in these particular communities. On the flip side, so the professional managerial occupations were sort of these high skill, high wage jobs. On the other end, we have these lower skill services jobs. These would be people employed in the per personal services industry, the food industry, the entertainment, the retail industry. They're typically lower skill, lower wage jobs. Now, looking at my analysis from 1970 to 2000, I found that actually these lower end services jobs actually reduce poverty because having a job is better than not having a job. But it actually increases near poverty. So it's enough, having one of these lower skill services jobs is enough to raise you out of poverty but still keeps you in near poverty. This would be the manifestation of the working poor, people that are working several jobs uh, but still aren't able to, to be 200 or 300 percent above, above the poverty level. Uh, the implications, what I see for the current recession out of this analysis is that um, in general there's only been moderate losses in these, these lower skill services industries. They haven't been as hard hit as uh, a lot of the professional services occupations. And uh, if history is any gauged, gauge, most of these jobs will experience a fairly fast recovery. Hiring goes fairly quickly in these, um, in these lower skill services jobs in retail and personal services industry. So this indicates that even though in the near term it may prevent communities from slipping into poverty, in the long term it's going to uh, generate systemic near term or working poor conditions in a lot of communities that are dependent on these low skill services jobs. Uh, okay, I'll skip the third finding. Um, okay. So the second thing I want to address, in, in addition to looking at changes in economic structure, I also looked at, uh, my model was a multi-level model, so I was interested in how state level policy affects poverty and near poverty at the county level. So could you, were, did different state, you know, federalism is, also, is known as sort of the laboratory of the state. States try different welfare policies and we can compare how that's impacted different areas in different, in, in different states. So what impact does state policy have on reducing uh, local poverty? Well, one of the strongest predictors of reduction of local poverty and near poverty is strong state economic performance. So if the state is growing at a fast rate, that was associated with a strong reduction in local poverty rates. What does this mean as a, as a policy implication? That states should focus economic development efforts on their most competitive industries and most competitive regions. Because in some sense, what my finding shows, at least back to 1970, that a rising tide does tend to lift all boats. That a strong state performance will benefit all communities. And the mechanism that does that is through the redistribution system of, of the government. Taxation and redistribution of, of wealth through education and government programs. This means that states should not necessarily focus on narrow local development projects, but really focus their, their, their incentives, their development efforts on the strongest, most competitive industries and regions uh, in their states as a poverty reduction strategy. The second state policy that seems to matter the most is states that have higher unemployment benefits is also strongly associated with reductions in poverty and, and near poverty. So as a policy implication, states should maintain, extend, and increase unemployment benefits a, as much as possible. Uh, of course, this is going to uh, maintain household incomes and, and promote consumption. And the federal government has done that by extending unemployment benefits and also making low interest loans to states whose unemployment insurance trust funds have, are near uh, insolvency. Um, so those would be the two, uh, two state policies. And I also looked at a variety of, of, of spending issues. Um, Interestingly, um, state spending on education, both K through 12 and higher education, was only moderately associated with reductions in, in poverty, and the function, and the, the trend wasn't linear. So, at higher levels of, of spending, increased levels of spending didn't really result in reductions in poverty. So there seemed to be some threshold beyond which increasing more spending doesn't isn't associated with reductions in, in poverty. 
Also, state spending on health, housing, and community development did not reduce poverty, but tended to reduce only near poverty. So what's the implication? Even though education spending and spending on, on social programs has clear social benefits, the spending in these areas only marginally reduces local poverty and local near poverty. And again, I said these, these trends aren't linear. They tend to flatten out. So my recommendation would be that states should not necessarily increase funding in these areas, but basically hold that funding flat and any additional funding they may get directed towards other areas of developing the economy through incentives for new job creation, um, in extension of earned income tax credits at, at the state level, um, and extension of unemployment benefits. Those would be the policies that would tend to uh, really promote reductions in poverty and promote economic well-being at, at the local level. And I think that's it for time. Excellent. Um, yeah, thank you uh, to all panelists. So we have a lot of um, uh, elements on the table. Um, we talked about the roots of the current recession. Uh, we talked about some of the manifestation and characteristic uh, of the uh, um, current recession and the outlook for the recovery. And then we have um, discussed a little bit some of the implication from the perspective of rural poverty. So I'd like to open it up for question uh, and discussions. So um, I believe there is a mic uh, there, so don't be shy and um, grab it and, um, and ask the questions. Um, I would like you to uh, state your name first uh, as you um, um, uh, articulate your, your question. And if you have a specific um, a speaker that you want to address to, please do so. Otherwise, we'll flip a coin uh, <laughs> up here. So again, it's uh, Professor Frankel, Professor Razem, and Professor Peters. My, my name is Don Lambert, and uh, this is just a general question relative to Wall Street and the problems that <clears throat> it created in this whole financial mess. And somebody had mentioned about regulating these risky investments and so forth. I, I just wondered if. Uh, if you think there is a, this issue is being addressed so that it would help mitigate ever having a problem like this again and you know one of the things you also hear about is you know reducing these high salaries on wall street and so forth i don't know if you really think that's the answer or what can we do to help uh, stop uh, this kind of thing from happening in relative to what happened on wall street and so forth these risky investments you want to do that one? Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> in terms of salaries, I do believe that uh, that there is a problem of excessive executive compensation, not just in the financial firms, but also in other large corporations. Uh, essentially, the problem comes from a separation of ownership and control in the sense that the stockholders are disorganized and decentralized, and, and they own the company, and the and the chief executive officer is usually buddies with the board of directors that sets his or her salary, and you can imagine you know, how that works. Um, as to what there is to do about that, I'm not sure, but I do agree, I think it's a problem that, uh, for which some, some sort of government action um, would be potentially helpful. Uh, in terms of the regulation of the, um, of, of the banks and of uh, the mortgage-backed securities, I, it's a difficult dilemma because on the one hand, uh, it would be, I mean, in a sense, it would be best for banks to have to hold the loans to maturity. Um, the question is, because then they would, they would take into account the impact of the person's credit history on their chance of repaying the loan. Uh, so that's one solution, and, um, and at least temporarily, I think we're close to that situation in the sense that at least the mortgages aren't being repackaged so that whoever buys them, would, I mean, for if they are sold to another bank, the bank knows, you know, the address that, of the bank that, send the, that sold them the loan, so there's a person that they can talk to there, and so there's some accountability. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I think that, uh, I think maybe it, it makes sense to wait and see. I mean, it's, it, for, uh, basically there's no, the, these, these securities aren't being issued anymore. So um, it may make some sense to think about, about regulating them. I mean, one of the, another problem w was that the rating agencies like S&P and Moody's 
we're overrating the safety of these bonds, of these mortgage-backed securities, and giving them AAA ratings, whereas really they probably should have gotten, you know, B minus ratings or something like that. So, um, so, th and that's another issue where uh, the, um, you know, how, who are they accountable to? These these rating agencies. Uh, it, it is a mess, and it does. It definitely, you know, needs to be addressed. And and, uh, however, I don't know what what needs to, what could be done about it. Something should be done, though. I agree. I thought uh, there was a, a story on NPR where they actually went back in and looked at banks that had uh, higher shares of portfolios in AAA rated bonds, and those banks actually ended up in bigger trouble because they were paying less. I mean, they were getting a lower return because these were supposed to be the most secure stuff that they were buying. And while I agree that there's, there's some, some blame to throw up uh, at Wall Street, you have to understand that they're buying mortgages that originated on Main Street. And there are rules that you used to have to follow when you originated a loan, which was there had to be a house. <laughs> There had to be someone <laughs> who was going to pay a mortgage. That person had to have some income or some credible commitment that they were actually going to make payment. And uh, technically, the person who originates the loan, if the loan is bad, uh, they're supposed to make good on that according to the rules. Now, of course, if you originate a whole bunch of stuff and then you declare bankruptcy or you disappear, or you go out of business before people catch on. I mean, there's a lot of fraud that, that occurred in this thing. And, you know, you can say that Wall Street should have anticipated that. But this is, as David said, uh, the issuance of, of mortgage-backed securities was a long-time boring bit of business. AIG got in trouble insuring things because they knew that the mortgage default rate was 1% for 35 years. So what's the chance that all the mortgage-backed securities are going to go bad at once? You know, when you write insurance, what's the chance that all the houses are going to, you know, burn at once? And Well, it turned out all of them went bad at once, and the reason was once people didn't know which were the good mortgage-backed securities and which were the bad mortgage-backed securities, all of them lost value. And this is the market for lemons phenomenon, right? Why is it that, uh, you know, your car is worth $2,000 less when you, when you, you know, drive it off the lot? Because nobody sells a used car an hour after you, you buy it. So you have to presume that it's a lousy car. Well, that's the same with mortgage-backed securities. So there's enough blame to go around on these things. And, and so I think we have to be a little bit cautious about assuming that it's all, you know, that all the problem is on Wall Street. I don't think that that's at all the case. The second thing is that never assume that you can anticipate all the problems. I mean, for, for every time you've figured out all the problems that have existed in the past, there's a thousand people trying to create a new one because they think that they can make money on some new financial innovation. And it's very difficult to regulate things that you don't know what they are. I'm not entirely convinced that anyone would have known enough to regulate this properly, and in fact, the regulations that were in place weren't effectively enforced. So it may well be that the real problem here, uh, number one, started on Main Street, and so that's where the regulation broke down. Uh, and number two, I don't think we have enough people to actually have regulated this. I think this problem would have existed even if, if they had uh, had more severe regulations. They couldn't have enforced them. Sorry. No, that's, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to sort of ask some questions that I think probably the audience needs to, to, needs to hear the answers to. Um, <clears throat> one is, Peter, you, um, you said you were going to tell us whether you thought the stimulus package had had any effect. So the counterfactual, of course, that is, that is asked is, would this have been the Great Depression in the absence of the stimulus package? Because, of course, one of the things we know about the Great Depression is that the Federal Reserve sat back and did nothing, in part because they didn't know what we know today about macroeconomics. And so the, the question, really, that I think many people in the audience are interested in your thoughts on are, you know, would it have been the Great Depression in the absence of a stimulus? And I'll sit down after, and then the second question, and I'll sit down, and you can, anybody can take it, is to, 
to talk about the issue of derivatives as essentially bets, you know, side bets. And the part of the problem is that people were betting on things uh, that really had no value. So, but, but I think the first one's probably more important. Well, I think we can divide things into different parts. And one of them was early on uh, in the recession, once we started seeing that there, were, there was severe financial weakness, well, take AIG. Should we have bailed out AIG? AIG was, in essence, insuring uh, mortgage-backed securities. So somebody buys a mortgage-backed security, and there's some risk. They don't know precisely if this one's going to be a good one or a bad one, but they had some idea as to what the risk was going to be, and AIG insures against that risk. And so uh, if you buy your insurance from AIG, you think you have a 100% secure um, asset. Well, it turns out that if AIG can't make good on the insurance, if it turns out that that mortgage-backed security is in bad shape, once again, uh, financial institutions that thought they had absolutely secure assets, they're not secure if your insurance company goes out of business. So was it important to keep AIG afloat? My sense is yes, because you would have had this cascading uh, sequence of um, um, financial institutions that would have failed. So I think that part of it is fine. Now, the part where um, we have um, the federal government now running a $1.4 trillion deficit uh, for fiscal year 2009. So why are they doing that? Well, they see that there's weak uh, uh, consumer demand. Uh, we actually have the weakest investment climate now since 1947. As a share of GDP, private investment is less than 1% of GDP, which is the lowest level since, since 2000 and, or since 1947. So uh, uh, what's GDP? Well, in, in principles of economics, it's C plus I plus G plus X minus M, right? It's consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. All that stuff is down, so the government's going to step in and try to shore up GDP. Now, for every dollar that the government uh, puts into uh, expenditures, under the Keynesian model, well, you get more than a dollar back in GDP because that dollar is going to get translated through the economy. Does that actually work? Robert Barrow, um, who may or may not win the Nobel Prize, you know, in, uh, before he dies, I guess that's one of the criteria. The odds have decreased. Yeah, you can't be dead and win the Nobel Prize. I think we had Vickery, who died four days after, uh, three days after. Well, you know, I guess. Uh, um, but he got it, right? I mean, someone, someone got a benefit out of that. Anyway, um, uh, but anyway, Barrow uh, has estimated uh, that it, you get about 60 cents of GDP for every dollar of spending. And the reason is that as you increase government spending, it crowds out private investment and it cried, crowds out consumption. So that's why that part of it may not have worked as well. The second reason is, what's the difference between stimulus and pork barrel? Stimulus sounds so much better, right? But if you look at what was in that package, some of it they're not planning to spend for, you know, years from now. I mean, so there's a lot of stuff in there that they, they have only spent about half the stimulus money. And so why is it not working? It's because they didn't target it to things that actually would stimulate the current economy. Some of it won't get spent until uh, years from now. I'd like to address your questions also. Uh, very briefly, I, I think that... Um, you have to distinguish between the monetary stimulus and the fiscal stimulus, and in my opinion, without the monetary stimulus, we may have been in a Great Depression, but the, the fiscal stimulus is probably less, less critical to avoiding that. Um, with respect to derivatives, I think the main problem with derivatives is that uh, people who invest in them don't understand them, and they don't understand how leveraged they are, that is how volatile they can be, uh, but they can be used for hedging, which is definitely a good thing for people who want to hedge risks. Peter in the middle. Um, we, has, we saw a great talk uh, just earlier on this week from a lady talking about Enron, and she called the uh, unraveling of Enron the um, canary in the coal mine. And um, it appears that we've just had the wiping out of the menagerie. It, can uh, you speak up? Or we appear to have wiped out the uh, menagerie with the, uh, the latest financial crisis. 
if the illusion of wealth that we had from the banking sector continues and you extrapolate that to the United States as United States Inc., if the, uh, the amount of money, money that we're borrowing from overseas stops and, for instance, the currency collapses, would you, how big a recession, or how, much, how deep will the unemployment rate, do you have a sense of how deep that might go if that happens? Um, you want to handle that one? Or I, the, the, the issue is, I, I mean, there, there are a few issues in there, but I think the fundamental one is what happens if people no longer want to let us borrow? Okay, the, the federal government is now 28% of GDP. A year ago, it was 20% of GDP. We have never embarked on such a huge increase in borrowing uh, other than during World War II. I mean, this is the largest uh, federal share of GDP since World War II, and there, you know, it, it, there, there was sort of a, you know, p potentially a more important reason to, to be uh, borrowing money. In this particular instance, uh, what is allowing us to, to borrow this money is the willingness of other people to buy government bonds. And I think the Chinese now own over a trillion dollars of federal debt. What happens if they don't uh, want to buy any more of that stuff um, or they want to sell it? Okay, suddenly, um, and we're beginning to see some, some, some elements of inflation in the, in the U.S. economy, and, and the answer is you would get an, a huge increase in interest rates in the United States. Okay? Why haven't the Chinese done that? It's because to some extent they would be, I mean, uh, my sister who's in the banking industry says uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, you owe us a million dollars, we own you, and if you owe us a billion dollars, we you own us. I think that right now the Chinese and the U.S. are in one of these sort of dysfunctional uh, credit relationships where they can't do what they might want to do, which is sell government bonds. But if they decided to do that, or even if they stopped buying government bonds, we would not be able to, 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 to handle this debt. Now, how could we handle it? Print money, I mean, is one of the ways that we could do it. We could do the Argentine um, solution, but we would have massive inflation, rising interest rates, and that wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, so I think right now we are in somewhat of a knife edge uh, on that. I, what would you think? Um, I, agr I agree with you, what, what you said. <laughs> Speaking about the federal debt, I recently saw on uh, the debtclock.org's website that when you average out the total debt, the unfunded liabilities that the U.S. government has, uh, each person's individual debt um, for mortgages, credit cards, etc., the deficit, when you calculate that out to every single person in the United States, it averages over $300,000 we're in debt. How in the world are we going to ever get out of that? Sell Wyoming. <laughs> I mean, that's how we, how, why, how did we get the, you know, the Louisiana Purchase was Napoleon's debts. That's how we got uh, uh, Alaska was the Russian debt. I don't think it's quite that high, actually. I think, I thought it was about, I actually was on that same site, and I thought it was 38,000. But anyway, it's a big number. Uh, at the end of the day, it's not a question of will the U.S. be insolvent. If you look at the U.S. as a as an asset statement, and look at all the property that the U.S. owns. I mean, we can sell stuff, and in fact, we've been selling parts of the United States privately for a long time. Right? There's a lot of foreign ownership of capital and land in the United States, and part of that is how we've been able to run trade deficits over a long period of time. Uh, and, you know, we they send us, uh, you know, whatever automobiles, and we send them golf courses in Hawaii and stuff like that. Uh, so that's all right. I don't think that the issue is, is the U.S. in danger of becoming insolvent. I do think that uh, there's some issues as to whether and how long or whether we can reverse this level of borrowing in a short period of time. And I, I mean, I do have concerns along the lines of the, of the previous question on that. But don't you think, Peter, that it's a problem that the, that the automobiles we're buying de decrease in value at about 15% per year, but the golf courses are increasing in value. 
I don't know. <laughs> I, I thought our golf courses were in real trouble all of a sudden. I, I mean, mean, they must be a better investment than cars. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I got a great Honda. <laughs> huh? Oh, who knows? Their Honda's made in the U.S. In fact, at one time, there was one car in the United States that was 100% made in the United States, and that was Honda. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. I can't tell you if this is one of those Hondas. More questions? Um, how much of the recession, recession would you say is responsible for the recent discussion of oil being traded under some other currency? Does that have any influence whatsoever, or does that relate to the uh, general debt that the United States has? Can you um, repeat the question? I'm sorry. The, oh, the question is, how much does the does the does the recession have to do with the uh, recent discussion, the international discussion of oil being traded under some other currency than the dollar? Well, there is a. I mean, the, uh, there's uh, particularly the the Chinese have been proposing either some form of international currency, which would be a weighted index of a number of different currencies, and that might be related. I don't know about the specifics on the oil part of it. What I've been hearing more about is whether or not uh, people are wanting to use a different currency than the uh, than the U.S. dollar for for uh, um, uh, for other international transactions. If you go back to, I think it was England after World War II, and the and the and the British uh, pound sterling was the 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 currency of of note, and the British were completely. Um, uh, in trouble. I mean, if, if you're talking about the Chinese being our creditors, at the time the U.S. were the creditors for, for, for England. And for years, we had just lent money to England at zero interest rates and like 50-year repayment or something along those lines. And suddenly, after World War II, we said, sure, we will, uh, we will lend you money, but now you have to pay 2 percent and um, uh, the terms are, are more stringent, and by the way, we're going to use the dollar as the, as the medium of exchange in international trade. And there was a Wall Street Journal article on this actually this morning, so I'm, I, I, I didn't know any of this crap I'm stuff until, uh, uh, until this, uh, the, this day. This is actually before that, but uh, it was part of that whole process. And gradually over that period of time, the British had to unravel their entire colonial powers because they couldn't afford this stuff anymore because they couldn't borrow anymore. This issue of the U.S. squandering our potential asset in a strong dollar is, <laughs> I mean, that was the point of this, this, this uh, essay, was we're beginning to look like England after World War II. And so if that's the case, then the terms that we imposed on England after World War II might be imposed on us now. And if that's the case, then we will start losing control over our own currency. And uh, we will have to start making trades in somebody else's currency, which is going to, to cost us. We won't be able to use cheap dollars to, to buy our way out of our debt problems, for example. And we have talked about uh, uh, Wall Street and we have talked about Main Street, uh, but one thing that should be clear is that the uh, imbalance that led to the um, financial uh, crisis and now the, um, uh, the recession has uh, a big uh, overseas component as well. And so what we read is incredible strong growth in uh, large economies. Uh, China, of course, is the one that everybody thinks about, and, and very high saving rates compared to um, uh, mature economy like the United States. So this money had to go somewhere, you know, and so this is what people uh, think about when they talk about the huge saving glut, you know, there's this, you know, huge amount of money that uh, uh, needs to be invested in the U.S. was um, because of its, the size of the economy and uh, um, what it was thought, the maturity of its financial sector was the 
uh, the destination of these, uh, of these savings. And, and we've had to come to terms with some of the shortcomings of, uh, of that strategy. Uh, in, in the medium term, and I think that has something to do with uh, the outlook for the recovery, is that the recovery is not just uh, getting over uh, the binge of the, of the financial distress, but the recovery is gonna have to uh, entail restructuring of some elements of the U.S. economies. We're gonna have to produce more goods and we're gonna have to export more goods, and that's pretty much uh, a, a must in the long run uh, if we want to, uh, to get on a solid, um, uh, growth again, and that's going to take time, and so recovery won't come, won't come easy, and won't come fast. Uh, at least that's one, uh, one outlook. Um, please state your name and the question. Okay, uh, Ryan Gardner. I live in Ames here. Uh, uh, for uh, Professor Azeman, you commented about uh, uh, the unemployment rate in Iowa, 6.8, nationally 9.8. Let's just say for computation that it's uh, 7% and 10%. Now, I assume that you are taking the government's reports as unemployment, but we all know, or most people eventually figured out, that there are those who do not qualify for unemployment and there are those that have exhausted it, which usually makes it three times greater than the government's estimations, which means that 20% of Iowa is out of work and one third of America is out of work. 30% of the people in America don't have a job. That's really bad. I mean, these people come along and say, oh, it's only 9%. It's 30% or more. And this is a serious problem. And this is when the 30s, they almost had an armed revolution for the same thing. And then they came along and come up with the social programs. You know, these communists, there's a socialism here. Uh, so I think that estimate there is, is, uh, should be adjusted to reality and not just to the numbers from the government. You and uh, you? Uh, yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is, is that there are different measures that the government releases. And the unemployment rate uh, is, is the longest used one, but they also have underemployment rates. They have measures of long-term versus short-term unemployment rates. And then they have measures of what they call um, discouraged workers, people who are no longer considered unemployed because they, they, in order to be considered unemployed, you have to not have a job and be actively seeking work. But if you've stopped seeking work, then you're no longer considered uh, unemployed. The reason that you don't get a, a very different answer is all of these things tend to move in, in, in close to lockstep with one another, so they're fairly highly correlated. I don't think you're ever going to get, I mean, remember, we've only lost 5%. I mean, jobs are the easy, I'm, I'm not a particular fan of the unemployment rate either, so I, I would share your, your concern there. I like to measure jobs because that's a concrete thing, right? People are paying for those jobs if you're, if you're firms or if you're self-employed. And we've lost 7 million jobs, and I think that's more concrete than the unemployment rate being 10% uh, versus 7% and then underemployment being, okay, you're working part-time, uh, you know, and you'd rather work full-time or something along those lines. Um, but all of those things tend to, can, tend to um, move together in the same way. So you're not going to get misleading inference that the labor market is weaker now, and if the unemployment rate rises, well, the discouraged worker rate also tends to rise, and so you get the same types of things. But anyway, I, I take your point. Mm -hmm. uh, for Professor Peters, uh, there was a comment about the growth, and one of the problems I've found from studying banks and banking and money and finance is that the, 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 the I, a while ago I mentioned it, is that the two vicious cycles that they have in the banking industry where the Federal Reserve System, which controls all the money, will have a boom and a bust, and they will have um, uh, the growing economy. They're constantly putting this, their, their Federal Reserve credit money into it, the circulation, so it increases really 10.3% per year. On mm -hmm. uh, like a clockwork, when they had the M factor out there, I'd watch it and I could calculate it right along. Every year, ten, every ten, a year, 10.3%. You have a question, sir? Yeah, the, well, the question is, uh, um, when he determines this growth rate, uh, does he calculate in the idea of the inflation, which is the increase in supply of money? which then follows the increase in prices and then wages. Yes, yes I do. Okay, because I know Bernanke, terms, yeah. Bernanke in front of the Housing uh, uh, Banking Committee a while ago, just recently, 
said that inflation was the increase in the consumer price index, which is a big lie. Yeah, Ever since the 1700s, when I've picked up a dictionary and looked up the word inflation, it said exactly that. It's the increase in the supply of paper money, followed by an increase in prices and then wages. So the yeah. guy's not telling the truth, or he knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah, I mind uh, that GDP figure was adjusted in for producer prices rather than the CPI. No, I think he, he meant it as inflation, just you know, overall inflation. Well, there's because the CPI uh, is a little inflated. Congressman Ron here, Paul but. nailed him on it, but he, you know, there's nothing you can do with a guy like that. Hmm. Thank you. Um, anybody else wants to pitch in before we wrap it up? Well, I have a question <laughs> for the economist. <laughs> oh, gosh. Especially the labor economist. Here. I mean, we talk about jobs, and, of course, the, the job figures are a little misleading because they're not in full-time equivalent jobs. They're, you know, a five-hour-a-week job is just considered the same as a counted as one job as a 40- or 50-hour-a-week job. So my question, at least for, for Iowa, you know, you kind of hear anecdotally that in the last recession, the 2001-2002 recession, it took us to about the beginning of this recession to recover the jobs that we shed in the previous recession. I guess two questions. One, how long do you think it is before we recover those jobs in Iowa? And secondly, well, how, how is the economy going to look different? So you said durable goods, Iowa's taken a big hit. Is that going to remain, dis is that in industry going to remain greatly diminished, or are we going to recover those jobs, or do you see any large-scale changes in the, the economic structure, the employment structure of Iowa? Um, I know it's a little, no, I mean, I'm sure I, about your crystal ball, but. <laughs> it's always, uh, you always wonder, okay, you know, can't you be Nostradamus and make predictions 500 years in the future, mm -hmm. and then, of course, people are looking at this stuff, and you go, you know, guy's been dead for 500 years or whatever it is, but, you know, he's a genius, right? Because, uh, uh, so I, I'll, I'll make a prediction out 30 years, because I have at least some chance of being dead by then. Uh, Manufacturing, Iowa actually is about the fourth strongest manufacturing state relative to the size of the, of the, of the state economy. Uh, and we actually were gaining jobs in manufacturing until the 2001 recession. Um, we gave a bunch of those back then. We started coming back a little bit in manufacturing, and then we really got nailed. But we got nailed in durable goods. Our, our non-durable goods, the food sector, is actually doing reasonably well. I mean, not, I mean, we've given away some jobs, and I have the numbers here somewhere, uh, but not nearly at the rate uh, nationally. So I think non-durable goods, those jobs are going to come back faster. Is it because they're mainly ag-related? They're ag-related, but also the demand is a little bit less cyclical. I mean, you eat food even in a recession. Mm. Uh, you don't necessarily, uh, well, I guess we bought a lot of cars in August, but we're, we, we we're done with that now. Okay, so... Uh, um, um, but, uh, you know, how long before Winnebago comes back? Um, uh, I mean, they had the double whammy of high gas prices, and now uh, no, nobody has money to buy these things. John Deere, uh, we had very high commodity prices for about three or four years, not just in the U.S., but internationally, and now, I mean, there's weakness there. Uh, I think it's going to take longer for the durable goods manufacturing to come back, but... Um, uh, will we come back at the same level? We didn't come back in 2001, and, and I, I, I would guess some of those jobs are gone. Um, so I think non-durable goods, are, it's more promising than durable goods. Um, I know we have somebody in line, but it's way past 9 o'clock, and um, so I think we should uh, thank the speakers for a, uh, a terrific presentation. Thank you very much. If you want to come up and ask the question, then that's yeah, fine. Yeah, I'm sure the speakers will be willing to uh, to stay around for a little while, but typically we wrap these things up at 9 o'clock. Hi, I just thought of this question. Um, I've heard several commentators talk about this has been in the worst of like 30 or 40 years, the recession, they've just been moving down the line to eventually getting to this point, basically. And uh, I thought, well, 30 or 40 years ago, we had a very strong middle class in this country. Mm -hmm. And today, we have 90% of the wealth concentrated in about 10% of the population, 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 about 10% of the population.